I'd got to a stage about 20 years ago when I, movie stars get to a situation and they get a script sent and I got a script sent and I send it, read the part and I send it back to the producer saying the part's too small. And he sent it back to me and he said, you weren't supposed to read the lover, you were supposed to read the father. <laughs> and I knew I was in deep doo-doo, so to speak. <laughs> And my days as a movie star was over. Uh, I was about, well, I was about 57, 58. And, and there is a moment then when producers also don't trust you. And so you, you, the only you get the sort of maniacal producer occasionally sends you a script who you then not send to anyone else. And you have to turn it down. And I, I, I turned everything down and I, I sort of said to myself, I'm fine, I, I'll write my biography. And, and I did. And I... I went off to Miami, and I opened another restaurant. I had a lot of restaurants, and I was very happy. I was a sort of bum. And one of my friends in Miami was Jack Nicholson, and then he suddenly turned up one day with a script called Blood and Wine. And I, I, I thought I had retired. I really did. I, my movie career was over. And he talked me into doing Blood and Wine, and I enjoyed so much working with him. I, I went back to work. And then what happened to me, I've had another 20 years of the most wonderful career and time that I, I could think of. I've won another Academy Award, I've won a BAFTA, Golden Globes, and I've had the best time. Do you think that actually the range of things that you've been offered subsequently in the last two decades has been that much wider? Yeah, well, that's what happens because you, you, you change from being a movie star into be a, being a, a, a leading actor in movies. And, and the difference between that is is when a movie star gets a script, he looks at it and says it makes changes to suit himself. When a leading actor gets a script, he changes himself to suit the script. And you also get less money in a smaller dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> but it's worthwhile because you get better parts. You know, you don't, I mean, basically all being a movie star about is if you're a romantic movie star is you get you you have the girl you lose her and you get her back that's it's that's the plot every time Even no matter how they dress it up but uh, um if you're a leading actor you lose your mind and don't get it back <laughs> <laughs> well, but actually that's not i mean that's not strictly true because that wouldn't have characterized your roles before 1992 you didn't you know carter for example yeah they, they, they weren't that. all sort of romantic but i i'm for me, I've, I've always wanted to, to act parts rather than be a personality in a movie, movies because what I, I was for nine years, I was a repertory actor. So I was, I was playing a different part like 40 or 50 weeks a year. And, and that's how I've treated my movie career. I, I, I always look for something different. I never look for sequels. The one thing that really comes out very strongly in this from the early years is that sense of complete dread that you had every time you performed, that you'd actually throw up, you know, you'd feel really bad about it. Yeah. And I'm interested to know what it was, even from those early days when you were pretending to the rent collector that there was no one in, yeah. <laughs> what it was you actually got out of it that was worth it, you know, it was worth going through all that hell for. Well, it, it was a sort of destiny I'd seen from myself uh, uh, as a, to, to become an actor in a very unlikely setting. We, you, you have to think, in, people say to me, uh, uh, did you go to drama school? I mean, not necessarily rather, but a little cheap local drama school. In my milieu, we never knew that there was such a thing as a drama school. If, if you think of uh, gangland, I mean, young boys, I mean, we weren't as fearsome as they are now because we, we were just alcohol and punch-ups and stuff, and, and, but, and now it's drugs, guns and knives. But there was no no sort of sense of that I, oh, uh, maybe I'll get into a, a minor drama school because I didn't know there was a drama school anywhere. I'd never heard of that. And, so, and it's very difficult to explain that to people for if you come from that. I mean, we're talking about, what, 60 years ago, you know, at the Elephant and Castle, just down there. Uh, uh, and, and, and so... When I became an actor, it, I, I became an actor quite accidentally, really, because I was, I was a soldier in, in national service. And when I came out, I was working in a factory with an old man. And, uh, and he said to me, you're not going to do this all your life, are you? I said, no. He said, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, well, I, I want to become an actor. He said, I said, but I, I, I don't really quite know how to go about it. 
Well, he said, I can tell you. I said, really? Is this this old guy? Old company guy? I said, yeah. He said, my daughter's a semi-professional singer. He said, and if you go to Solosi's uh, 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 newspaper agents, uh, opposite the Leicester Square tube station in Charing Cross Road, they have a paper in there called The Stage. And if you look in the back pages, they advertise for actors. And I said, really? He said, yeah. <laughs> and on the Saturday when I wasn't working, I went and it said, stage manager in small parts, Horsham Rep. And I went and I got the job. <laughs> and that's how I started. I mean, I was making the tea and all that uh, uh, and running around after everybody. But I, you know, and I was, uh, I didn't get very much money. I was always hungry. But I always look, I was always happy when there were parts where there was meals, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd order double and I'd, eat, I'd have my lot, you know. But there was, I mean, there was a sense when you started to do that that you felt that was what you wanted to do. I mean, you're making it sound oh, as though yeah. you're kind of No, 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 no. I, I really wanted to do it. And I, I, I wanted, uh, um, there was also a, cl a class and social thing in it because we used to watch British movies, which were usually, I mean, they were a sort of laugh, you know, for us, uh, uh, um, especially when they tried to do working class and gangster guys, you know what I mean? And we used to take the mickey out of everything and sit there laugh, roaring with laughter through dramas. And I thought to myself, uh, I could do that better than that. I can play that guy better than he's doing that. Because it was some guy who, from RADA who was trying to do a Cockney accent, you know. And then we'd see sort of love scenes in pictures, uh, movies, with, with people saying, I love you, and I love you too, you know, <laughs> and, and, and we'd go into hysterics. <laughs> and, 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 and I thought, I, I can go in there and do that properly, you know, uh, and, and, and be convincing uh, as a sort of working class person. And I was very fortunate because my doing that coincided with writers who wrote working class leading men. I mean, starting with, with obviously, John Osborne and look back in anger, and I, I did uh, Harold Pinder's first play, which was The Room, uh, which was a one act which I did at the Royal Court, and Arnold Wesker, you know, wrote The Kitchen. It wasn't, it wasn't a play about people having a wonderful evening in a restaurant. It was people about do, play about the people who do the washing up. And so I was very fortunate that the writers came just before I did, because if I'd tried to become an actor 10 years earlier, I would never have made it. Well, I think, we Mind you, by the way, yeah. the first part I ever got a success in uh, was, was in Zulu as a very toughy dose, well-spoken <laughs> officer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that happened. i tell you how that happened. Oh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I would never have got that part. If the director of Zulu was an American called Cy Enfield. If he'd have been an English director, I wouldn't have got that part because I went up for the Cockney role and he said, I've given it to your friend Jimmy Booth, but I couldn't phone you, I didn't have, a, I didn't have anything. And I, so he, he told me when I, and I was walking out, and it's all down, down, also down to the length of the bar at the Prince of Wales <laughs> Theatre where I was meeting him, <laughs> because a very long bar is right over there. And I got to there, and he said, wait a minute, he said, can you do an English posh accent? And I said, I can do any accent you want, I've been in rep for nine years, I've played everybody. And he gave me the part. He gave me a screen test, and I said, what was it like? He said, it was crap. <laughs> he said, but we've got no time. We've got to take it. <laughs> he said, if the accent goes wrong, we'll post-sync it. <laughs> so that was it. That was it. But I swear to you, I bet, I bet an English director would not have thought of me uh, to be the uh, 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 officer because they had seen me in a play called Next Time I'll Sing to You, uh, 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 Piccadilly Circus, what's the name of that theatre there? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I had played a Cockney in that, you know. That's why they brought me up to do the Cockney Corporal, you know. Anyway, so th that's the story of how I got to start. That's how my movie role started by the bar at the Prince of Wales being so long. <laughs>